Since 1948, the American Academy of Neurology has been promoting the highest quality patient-centered care. And with more than 40,000 members strong, the organization is dedicated to enhancing member career satisfaction. Welcome back to the sixth and final day. I'm Atria Godfrey and this is AAN TV. As we wrap up an incredible week of networking, learning and engaging with fellow physicians and researchers, we're turning our attention now to the AAN's health and wellness efforts. Today, we talk with Dr. Eileen Antonio about ongoing diversity, equity and inclusion efforts. Plus, we stop by the Wellness Hub to see how the AAN is offering everything from dogs to dancing to keep your brain sharp. And finally today, we wrap up our tour of the organizations and institutions blazing new trails in neurologic research. There is so much to see and so many ways to watch. You can always find the latest AAN TV episode airing on the TV stationed throughout the convention center. On the AAN website, on the in-house channels at some of our partner hotels, and on the AAN YouTube and Twitter channels. The need for equity and inclusiveness in healthcare has never been greater. The AAN is committed to embracing the diversity of the overall neurological community and highlighting those that are doing the same. That's why Dr. Eileen Antonio was selected to receive a grant this year, highlighting her experience in the DEI space, and she joins us here in the AAN TV studio. Pleasure to have you with us. Thank you so much, Atria. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay, first of all, congratulations on being a grant recipient. It has to feel great to be honored in this way. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, so um, I have two hats that I wear. So I'm a clinician as well as also a teacher for the neurology residents. So as an Asian, I feel um, that we are the silent race. We are that silent ethnicity that is always not represented Overlooked. in in research, yes, uh, and in everything else. So with this, I was able to put it out there and develop a study wherein, again, we go into the community, talk about stroke awareness, sleep apnea awareness to these, the underserved, of the underserved, of the Asians. So we've um, gone to the Nepali, the Burmese, the Vietnamese, um, and then the Mandarin Chinese and again, be able to bring that conversation into their community. And then at the same time, get the residents be part of it because we have to be intentional about how we teach diversity, equity, and inclusion. I can always give lectures. I can always have them participate in panel discussions. But ever since we started this project, the residents, I feel like a proud mom because the residents are just like, ooh, the growth um, from being able to understand it, from being able to communicate better to the Asians, to the community members, to the participants. It, it's just amazing to see how much they've learned and how much they practice it every day. You are like a proud mom. <laughs> I <Can> am. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit more about your background and how you became so um, actively involved in the DEI space? I mean, is this something that you took note of when you were in medical school? So I'm a foreign medical graduate. So um, coming here, I was first, so I did my medical school in the Philippines. Okay. I was an ophthalmology resident there and I already knew I wanted to become a neuro-ophthalmologist. I'm going to date myself because that was the time of dot matrix and dial-up <laughs> internet, um, but was eventually able to land a fellowship here in the United States and, and then did my additional neurology residency. So all along, again, as, an, as a Filipino, as an Asian, I've seen the difference. I've seen what it's like, not just as a clinician myself and having felt that from patients or even other doctors, um, that inequity <clears throat> in how they deal with me, but also in how we tend to take care of, again, the, the underserved right. population. 
you mentioned that you have seen some progress and that you know you're, yes. you're, you're noticing some changes. Is there still more, more work to be done though? For sure, there is a lot more work to be done. And I'm glad that again, it's more transparent there that uh, we are moving towards more awareness, but definitely. So one of the big changes that needs to be done would be make it a part of education. Make it a part of the learning that they do because this is definitely important and it has to be integrated. It has to be intentional. Um, the other part is there's still a lot of work to be done from the policy, policy side, from the advocacy side, and you know, being active with Neurology on the Hill, being active with our advocacy folks here, talking to our legislators, because that's where we need to make sure that policies change and this is front and center. Right, we need to see that change at a very high level. Yes, for sure. Okay, you received the Healthcare Equity Scholarship last year. What did that grant help you accomplish? More awareness, more learning, more networking. Um, because I feel that being able to see who are the other players and um, I have so much to learn and they have taught me so much. And it's being able to hone that, not just the relationship, but also learn from what they've already done and what else needs to be done. So it was a beautiful opportunity. Wonderful. Well, we certainly appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. Wishing you all the best in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now we bring you a story of hope and progress in the world of medicine. Extinguish is a clinical study exploring a promising new treatment for a rare and debilitating autoimmune condition, and they are currently looking for new patients. NMDA receptor encephalitis is a condition that occurs when the immune system attacks the brain, specifically the NMDA receptors in the brain. And it can cause perfectly healthy individuals to overnight start experiencing seizures, have onset of sudden psychosis, hallucinations, paranoia. With the Extinguish trial, we're attempting to better understand NMDA receptor encephalitis from all angles. What's the best treatment? How do we predict recovery and outcomes for the patients? And how do we do a better job overall taking care of patients with NMDA receptor encephalitis? We need your help to get these very ill NMDA receptor encephalitis patients to trial centers. NMDA receptor encephalitis patients happens in one in a million. We cannot afford to miss a patient. Call the Extinguish Hotline day or night, 24 seven. Our phone number is 844-4BRING-5. Again, 844-427-2465. And together. 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 We can make the future brighter for NMD receptor encephalitis patients. The most widely read and highly cited peer-reviewed journal, Neurology, is the official journal of the AAN. Editor-in-Chief Dr. Jose Marino sits down with us now to discuss what we can expect from the journal this year. Pleasure to have you with us today. Great to be here. All right, let's talk about what your vision is for the Neurology Journal this year. So the Neurology Journal, like every year, we're interested in really having it be a venue for the most impactful research that's related to clinical neurology. So anything that will help us understand our patients better, whether it's epidemiology, whether it's uh, clinical trial results, whether it's a, a large observational studies looking at risk factors. We're very interested in all of those as long as they help us understand the patients that we see better. As the most widely read and also highly cited peer-reviewed journal, uh, does that bring with it an added layer to make sure that your accuracy is on point? I think all journals, whether they're highly read or not, <laughs> should really be focusing on accuracy. So we're very interested in research that's methodologically robust. So we always look at that when we're appraising papers in terms of the methods that were used and how the participants were selected, how the data were collected, how they were analyzed, and then make sure that the conclusions drawn are really based on the data and not a spin or, or something else. Right, no spin. Um, you've been at this in this position as editor-in-chief for three years now. Any key pieces of research or studies that you'd like to highlight that really stand out to you? Well, I think we've had uh, uh, many different studies that have come throughout the years. It's very hard to pinpoint one of them, but I think that 
we tend to focus, again, on things that are clinically relevant that will help us understand our patients and that really move the field forward. So that's uh, very much the, the focus that we have. I mean, we're seeing a lot of studies related to uh, understanding the pathophysiological mechanisms, what are the mechanisms for disease, and then why drugs are working the way they are. As you um, look ahead for anyone who may want to submit their research or even find out the way in which they might be able to do so, what do you want them to know? And then what would you say to somebody who might be hesitant to do so? Start, start early on, right? So start with the research so that you uh, have a relevant research question and you have the, the right methods to analyze it. And then when you're reporting it, try to be as transparent and as complete as possible. Uh, use things like uh, reporting guidelines and things to help you make sure that uh, things are where they should be and that you include all the relevant information and follow the uh, instructions in the author center, which we think will help you write a better paper. Wonderful. All right. Thank you so much for your time today, Dr. Marino. Certainly appreciate it. And we should point out you can speak with anyone from the Neurology Journal here at their stand at the that, convention center. That's right. We look forward to talking. We hit the Wellness Hub today to see how AAN is making sure your mental health and wellness stays a top priority during this busy week. We don't just bring our skills and our knowledge to the workforce, we bring our whole selves. And what's interesting is that as a neurologist, I think that we understand more than anyone else about what sort of state the brain needs to be in to fully function. If we're not focusing on health and wellness, and if we're not bringing that to the table, then we're not bringing our full abilities. A wellness within the workforce is not typically a resiliency deficiency that is just an individual problem to solve. 70% of the contribution towards burnout and decreasing wellness in the workforce is actually how we set up the workforce. If we know that taking care of ourselves enables us to do our jobs better, then wellness is part of professionalism and should be treated as such. It should not be treated as something extra we do when we're falling apart. So while the wellness supports are incredibly important all the way from yoga to meditation and all that sort of stuff and all the fun that we've had here at the Academy is crucial, but also so is leadership development, so is decreasing frustrations in the workplace, and so are so many other things that we work on and frankly that the AAN also works on in all its different committees. One hundred years ago, neurosurgeons at Johns Hopkins University laid the foundation of our understanding of hydrocephalus. Now, the university's hydrocephalus and cerebrospinal fluid center is working to shape the next 100 years of treatment. The hydrocephalus and cerebral fluid center at Johns Hopkins carries on the tradition of Cushing and Dandy in using the laboratory to explore uh, the challenges of uh, cerebral uh, spinal fluid disorders and to develop new understanding and new treatments which are directly applicable and available for patient care. We have studies, experimental studies, where we put in tracers and, and look at the flow of fluid when it's put in different places. We also do research to help the, the neurosurgeon regulate that fluid drainage better. We have a project where the normal burr hole that every neurosurgeon makes can be used as a window using ultrasound in the clinic as an outpatient to look in and see the brain. So treatment, evaluation, uh, and diagnosis are all things that we are working on to make it better for, for, for the patients with hydrocephalus. From knowing whether or not your pilot is in peak flying condition to learning what that sip of wine does to your cerebellum, the Head Talk stage covered it all this week. All week long, the Head Talk stage has been a haven for offering new and unique ways to look at some everyday activities through a neurology lens. In Saturday's session, Would You Fly With This Pilot, FAA neurology panelists spotlighted cases of actual pilots with neurologic issues or symptoms, and then asked the audience if those pilots should be allowed to take off. This highly interactive format gave a glimpse of how the FAA applies clinical neurology to legal and occupational medicine issues. And you might think of that glass of wine as an opportunity to wind down and give your brain a rest, but did you know there's a neurology component to wine tasting? Sunday's Neurology of Wine Tasting reviewed what happens neurophysiologically and emotionally when we taste wine. Attendees learned why some wine causes stronger emotional responses and some doesn't. Then it was bottoms up for a blind wine tasting.
Cheers to that and to an incredible week here at the AAN 75th anniversary meeting. We have certainly enjoyed bringing you specially curated content discussing all things neurology. AAN TV might be wrapping up, but all of our interviews, films, and videos live on on the AAN website and YouTube channels. Thanks for joining us this week. It's truly been a pleasure, and we hope to see you again for next year's annual meeting. Until then, safe travels, everyone. Thank you.